think it's similar. Um, it goes way back to what was learned by folks like Howard Rheingold and Lisa Kimball and uh, Cliff Igalo in the early days of the well and the meta network was the basic dynamics of groups online. And I'm talking about bounded groups. So when I talk about communities, I'm talking about a group of people who've decided they're in, they have something in common or shared that they work on going forward together. And as I, you know, the whole idea of the online community manager has gain legitimacy. I remember when I started, you know, no one would pay you for any of that stuff. And it was kind of like a joke. Um, now, you know, companies are spending big money paying people to do this. But if you look at the patterns of what these folks are talking about, they're very consistent over time. You know, the ideas of relationship of trust of, you know, all, all sorts of the basics. And it's kind of funny to, to watch each generation who comes into the business to basically rediscover this and write these passionate posts about the way to do it and write these guides and I'm going like, okay, this is, this is the same. What is significantly different is the network effect. So when we started doing online stuff, we were talking about bounded groups on one platform, a discussion board or an email list very little variation in modality and usually very defined boundaries. You logged on, your password, your username. Now we've got this whole set of networked technology which allow people to be in different configurations across different platforms over time. So you think about Twitter and you think about who you follow or the list that you follow or the hashtags you follow and those people who follow you so that you have these very broad, diverse, loose connections. And so what we've enabled much more is connection across diversity if we choose it. You can also choose to stay in your own little, you know, funnel. Um, but that leads to lighter interaction. You know, we, we connect and move on, connect and move on. So there's like these little sparkles and then they go away, which provide value. But it's not the only place value happens. So that the stuff that requires commitment and connection over time, I think, can suffer in that environment. And I think the cutting edge is how do we use the diversity and the breadth of networks with the focused, intentional process supported by, you know, soft process or technologically supported process for accomplishing those things that require us to move together. And I think there's right now both the problem of how do I bridge and straddle across technologies um, and how do I pay attention? Because there are so many things I can be involved in. And, you know, I can have lots of shallow participation. How do I know when I need the deeper participation? And I think that's the cutting edge. And who's really succeeding at that? That's a good question. I don't know. I think people with intention manage to do amazing things. Um, but the distraction of the breadth is causing a lot of pressure and I see a lot more actually I see a lot more failure than I see success one of the things I'm working on right now is some action research is to try and understand you know how do we know if we're succeeding what are the things we're paying attention to what are the the kind of patterns that we can influence towards a, a more positive outcome versus and suppress the things that are actually blocking us and there isn't a lot of work out there to inform that if that work is old from the bounded community space. So if you look at the research, it, it really is out of date. It doesn't have that network perspective. The people who are studying networks are servicing lots of interesting stuff, but I'm not quite sure we figured out how to put that into practice. So we've got lots of intelligence that we can now get from the data. And this whole big data thing both absolutely inspires me and ticks me off because it's, yeah, so we have the data, but how do we use it? How do we use it to inform our practice going forward? So I think we're on the cusp but I don't know exactly where it's going. I can speak to that from the perspective of the field I work most in, which is international development, and that is that those of us who are trying to help get the heck out of the way, and people can connect and discover where they need to go deeper, how they want to collaborate or cooperate or co-create with each other, and they just do it. And technology enables them to do it, and they don't need anybody's support or permission. Because I think one of the things that really is messed up in development is the power dynamics. And I think technology creates that horizontal 
opportunity, but it's people who have to take the horizontal opportunity. And that, to me, is a huge opportunity. You see it in activism. You see, you know, you, we, we've definitely seen a lot of previews in the Arab Spring. Um, will we see more previews in what's going on in the Ukraine right now? Will we see more previews in how people are responding to disaster? Disaster response has been significantly changed by these connective technologies. But how do we leverage that so that those who have traditionally been in control no longer need to or necessarily have to be enabling it to happen, that people can enable it themselves. Because our problems are too big that we're facing. And to think that the, the well-informed experts are going to solve our problems is foolish because it's behavior change at every level that has to happen. And connecting may be a way to get there, hopefully. That's the optimistic view.